Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Consider that moment when you first meet someone. Hi, I'm me. Nice to meet you. You? How are you? Well, and you? Well as well. 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 So are you from around here? Yes, and you and it goes on from there. Maybe we talk about the weather or our marital status or the Bill's offense, though they need one before we can talk about it. But that, of course, is just the external conversation. As we know, there is also an entire internal conversation going on at the exact same time, a conversation that, by the grace of God, no one else ever And it begins before a single word is even uttered. We just use our sense of sight and smell to size up the other person and to put them in a nice, neat little box. Oh, they are tall guy, or nice face, or strange tooth. (laughs) And then, of course, the conversation begins, and a whole new set of judgments kick in. As we begin to immediately listen for those cues that we listen for, we listen for accent and use of vocabulary, and we just wait for that inner uh uh-oh to go off. You know, that red, yellow, or green light that tells us what we think of this other person? Now, maybe, just maybe there are those in the room for whom this never happens, who have reached that plane of existence beyond judgment, who, modeled after the example of Christ, just encounter everyone they meet without judgment. They are truly open to all. But that's not most of us. No, the truth is, if we're really honest, most of us should have our name tags changed to Judgy McJudgerton because we have turned our judgment into a spiritual discipline. We have become veritable experts, masters at sizing people up and discovering everything we think we need to know about someone on the basis of one conversation. Who among us hasn't been in a conversation when things are going well and they seem perfectly normal and then they say something that makes us totally reassign the category we've placed them in. What? He's a minister? Oh, and I thought he was normal. How many times did I swear in that conversation? We all do it, don't we? And the truth is, as we think back through the last couple of years, it's only increase, as that political divide has gotten wider, as the racial tensions we felt have increased, as that reign of rhetorical terror has become the norm, we have worsened our judgments, our judgments. We like a person until we learn how they voted or where they get their news or what bumper sticker they put on their cars. And we think to ourselves that if they don't think like us, they must not think. And it becomes a self-sustaining cycle. Because as we step apart from each other, the further distance we put between us and them, between those who are different than us, the harder it is to be gracious. But friends, we are called to be gracious. And part of grace is giving people the benefit of the doubt. 
Part of grace is giving people the benefit of the doubt. When was the last time we did that? When was the last time we didn't just assume the worst once we found out something about another person, but instead just kept going for a little bit to assume the best? Part of grace is assuming the benefit of the doubt, giving that person a little grace. The challenge, of course, is that our judgments are not always right. We are not always right, but the only way we can discover that is with people who are different than us. If we're in the same room listening to the same stuff, we can never discover where we might have gone wrong. We need other people around us to help make sense of who we are, people of different backgrounds from different places who were raised in different ways to better understand that truth that God is trying to reveal. The truth is the benefit of diversity is not just correctness, it's correction. The benefit of diversity is not correctness, it's correction. It gives us another point of view, another frame of reference, a possibility of understanding the truth, trusting that as Christ promised, the truth will set us free. The challenge, of course, is that the church struggles with this. We always have, but that's not who we are called to be. We need each other. That's part of life, not just some, but all. We need each other. Howard Thurman used to say, mutual interdependence is the fundamental characteristic of life. Mutual interdependence is the fundamental characteristic of life. In other words, we need each other, all of us. That's what the Christian faith is predicated upon. Remember, we're called to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We don't love in isolation. We need other people, and in that love we find life. That's how we got our mission statement as a church. Love God and neighbor, live fully, serve all, and repeat. But in order to figure out how to do that, what that looks like, we have seven values as well. And over the course of the next seven weeks, we are going to explore those values one at a time, beginning with being open to all. Because if we don't start with that one, then we don't have the people here to make sense of the others. If we don't begin with what the nature of community looks like, then we've missed the point already. Friends, we are called to be open to all, 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 not some, all. Not just people who look like us or smell like us or think like us or who voted like us, but all. As Paul was writing to the church in Galatia, he says to them, in Christ there is no longer Jew or Greek, there's no longer free or slave, there's no longer male or female. We like to think that we're the first ones to struggle with this, but the truth is, we kind of struggled with it from the very beginning. He's writing not because everything was going well, but because they were having a slight issue. You see that early church? All of the early churches were trying to figure out what they were supposed to do to follow Jesus. They were trying to figure out what does it mean to be a disciple and is it just for us? Remember, Jesus was Jewish. His first followers were Jewish and they were trying to figure out, do you need to be Jewish? Is this message for Jews alone? For the religious alone? Or for all? Now, Jesus was pretty clear. We hear it in that parable of the wedding banquet we told earlier, in which he says, it talks about what it means to invite people, all people, not some people, all people, the poor and the rich alike, to invite everyone, not just those people who will make us look good. And the early church kind of got it. They started to make some, under, they started to have some understanding that it was for everyone, that all were welcome at the table. But then came the really tricky part. We know this part, don't we? The tricky part is once you invite everyone in, you have to figure out what you're going to do with them. 
And if they were honest, they would prefer that anyone who comes in start to get in line, that is, to start acting like them. That is, all newcomers just start to pray like them and think like them and vote like them. But we can't be open to all and closed to change. And the beauty of our faith is that we don't have to fear change. Friends, the promise of the gospel begins with a recognition that none of us have this right. Not fully. And the only way we're going to figure out how to get closer to that which is right is together. We're only going to get closer to the truth together. The beauty of being a Methodist is that recognition that we are all moving ever onward toward perfection, which necessarily implies we are not there yet. I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, but we are more perfect together then we are apart. And our goal is to come together and get closer to the truth. Truth is revealed in community and over time. Truth is revealed in community and over time. It means change, yes but it also means life. And the benefit of diversity is not correctness, it's correct shun, turning towards the truth. The church in Galatia was really struggling. What they were really curious about was if they were gonna bring people into their church, did it mean that they had to be Jewish? first? Did they have to be Jewish to be Christian, or could they just be Christian? That is, did they need to go back and follow the dietary restrictions? Did they have to observe the Sabbath, and particularly challenging for the older males? Did we have to be circumcised? That was the struggle of the first century church. And Paul, seeing the writing on the wall, tries to offer a corrective. He's not telling them to ignore their Jewish past. He's saying to believe that God could be doing something new, that there is a new creation, that there is something which allows us to let go of some of the stuff which we've used to divide us and find that thing which can bring us together. He says we're children of God. We're children of the same God. And then he gets to this place in Christ There's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer male or female. There's no longer free or slave. Those were the categories he used in the first century. What might he use today? In Christ, there is no longer young or old, black or white, gay or straight, male or female, rich or poor, broken or whole, Republican or Democrat. What would it mean to believe that? It's not that those distinctions don't exist. They do, but they are secondary to who we are as people of faith. If we begin with the knowledge that the other person is a child of God, that is, a member of the same family, then we know how to communicate. We know that there's a part of us that we can connect with an other person on. Even if we can't see our way out of a paper bag, we can find our way to each other, and then we can find our way out together. That is who we are called to be as a church. The first thing we think when we step foot in the church is, how am I going to hear this as a Republican or a Democrat? Then we're missing the point. God is not Republican or Democrat or Libertarian or family party or feeling the burn. God is not even American. God is God. And our hope is that we can get closer to the truth that God reveals, knowing that where we find truth, we find God. And if it feels hard to do, Jesus gives us some hints at where to look. He begins with a sense of humility. That is, that first story about not finding taking the highest place that is the best place, he says, those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. 
He's not just talking about finding the right place. He's trying to say none of us should put ourselves higher than someone else. It's not to demean our worth, but to recognize that everyone else has worth as well. If we can look out in this world and recognize the other person as essentially someone of worth, regardless of their difference, we just might find our way closer to the truth. And the second, of course, is that cousin, that sibling of humility, hospitality. It's about inviting. That story of the banquet is about going out and finding those who are different than us and making sure that they have a place at the table. The Christian faith is about a recognition that we all have a place at a table. That's why we call the prayer at the beginning of a meal grace, because it's open to all. Do you see? That's the goal. That's where we're going as a people of faith. Here's the question. Who were the last people we had at our tables? Who were the last people with whom we broke bread? Did they look like us? Did they vote like us? Did they think like us? What would it mean if we were to overcome that political divide starting at our own tables? If we were to bridge that perceived racial gap at our own tables? we were to tear down that barrier between rich and poor at our own tables. Dining in for outreach is coming up. Maybe we want to consider who it is that we invite to our tables or whose invitation we accept. It's that fundraiser that raises money for our outreach ministries, but it's also an opportunity that is to try and put our faith into practice. If not there, then maybe we want to join a discipleship group. Eight weeks getting together with eight people to discuss those challenging issues in our world. Eight weeks, yeah, it's eight weeks, but eight weeks, and we can change the world. Why not try? It starts this week. Maybe that's what we would like to do. If not those, then how about something else? The point is, friends, being a person of faith is not just about sitting in the pews and nodding our heads or standing in the pulpit and pontificating. It's about doing something different in this world. And it takes all of us trying to figure out how to do it. And so here's your charge. Here's my charge. We preach what we need to hear. That at some point this week, whether it's when we leave here into the gathering center or head down to Wegmans or wherever we go on Monday morning, at some point this week, give someone the benefit of the doubt. At some point this week, when you hear your internal monologue, that internal part of the external conversation, start to judge someone else, that is to shut down, to cut off, to categorize them into a box that you can wrap up and keep on a shelf, to just keep it open for a moment, to take a step past that inner uh uh-oh and reach toward that higher plane of existence that is able to let go of our own stuff in the hope that we might find something new together. That's who we are called to be as a church. We are not a perfect place, but we are more perfect together than we are apart. We need each other, different than us. The benefit of diversity is not correctness, it's correction. Before we get cynical in this world and think it would all be better if everyone thought like us, maybe we should take a hard look in the mirror and figure out what we need to change. We can't change the world without changing the way we live within it.
May it be so. Amen.